guys. How are you? I was actually waiting for Katie. I guess she's running behind. But um, how's everybody this evening? I have a video that I need to play for you guys that I've been given permission to play. I also got a response from a victim from Jimmy for now. Uh, I missed her text earlier today. So, oh, there she is. Katie, I sent you the link, woman. Let me put it in here again. So you can, let me just drop it in the chat because I sent you the link to your email. Okay. So I have, um, I have a video that I'm going to play for you guys. I've been given permission to play it. And then there's another part of the video that I'm going to play after Katie and I discussed a few things. Dr. Melanie was supposed to be here this evening, but she's not feeling well at all. Guys, keep her in your prayers. She will be, she's going to try to be in chat. Hi. So I want to say Dr. Melanie sent me this book today. And I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So this is to go with my Instapot that she sent for me. So I got this today. Ooh, Instapot. So, and there's a lot of recipes in there. So I am really excited to start cooking some of these things that's here. So how are you today, ma'am? I'm good. How are you? I am good. I've had a busy, busy day. You're a busy, busy lady. Day. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't seen this yet. So I'm going to play this. And um, let me just put it on the screen for you guys. I'm going to drop us. I'm going to make it larger so you guys can see it. And let me just hit the play button. I want you to see this. I was leaned up against my face down. He had, was holding my face down with one of his hands. And he took his gun out, placed it against my head. finally got caught and went to prison in 2008 for kidnapping and sexually assaulting a woman while on police duty. This violent attack was recently called by Fennell's victim. After he was done, he put me back into the patrol car and told me that if I ever told anybody that when he got out of prison, he would hunt me down and he would kill me. In 1996, Jimmy Fennell's fiance, Stacey Stein, was found tortured and killed on a rural road. Rodney Reed, a local man, was eventually arrested and convicted of the crime and is facing imminent execution for Stacey's murder. However, a close examination of the physical evidence, court testimony, and newly gathered information from eyewitnesses indicates that Jimmy Spinell was the person who was the real killer of Stacey Stein. More shockingly, new evidence indicates that Spinell had help from other police officers in covering up the gruesome murder of Stacey Stein in a framing of Rodney Reed. By all accounts, Jimmy Spinell was a vicious, dangerous human being. Before and during the Stacey Stein murder trial, Jimmy Spinell was facing five separate charges in Gideon, Texas for police brutality. In one case, Spinell handcuffed 19-year-old Mario Murillo, forced him to his knees, and held a service revolver to his head. In addition, a woman who Spinell started to pursue less than a month after Stacey's funeral, filed an affidavit against Spinell stating, Jimmy didn't say black people. He used the N-word. The ends were all bad. All on drugs, all crooks. Jimmy Fidel. This was the man whose testimony was used as the entire foundation of the Stacey Stites murder trial. Jimmy Fidel, a vowed racist and convicted rapist, was and continues to be deemed credible by the court. At trial, Fidel said he had never known or met Rodney Reed. In fact, Jimmy Fidel approached Rodney Reed two weeks before Stacey Stites was murdered, angrily confronting Reed about Stacey. What well, made me mad? hurt me, so why do people have pain? So I, we thought, we took it as a threat. I said, who was? He said, that's Stacey's husband. I said, you mean Finnevia, husband, boyfriend, outside. He said, 
finna get married. But she really don't want to marry him. She want to have a life. The crucial part of the state's prosecution was, and still is, the claim that Stacey Snipes and Rodney Reed had never met before the day of Stacey's death. As recently as January 2014, a U.S. court affirmed this position. The lack of evidence of an actual relationship between Stites and Reed defeated Reed's assertion of innocence. This is one of the many witnesses who saw Stacey Stites with Rodney Reed. Like many others in this case, she continues to fear retribution from the local police and has asked that her identity be disguised. How many times did you personally see Rodney and Stacey together? I've seen them about four or five times. Down there by the two buildings they sell up at night. I think it's at night there. Yeah. Talking and stuff. They're like just up riding through the old river all the time. Yep. Did you know her name to be Stacy? Yeah, I knew Stacy. How'd you know her name? Because because when I go to the store, she worked at ATP. She got that big old night badge on her. I used to let her wait on me all the time because she was nice. I like her Stacy. To this day, the courts refused to believe that Stacy Stites and Rodney Reed had a relationship of any sort despite the following people stating they knew a relationship existed. Anonymous witness number one, Sandra and Walter Reed, Linda Westmoreland, Roderick, Richard, and Shantae Reed, Chris and Tanya Aldridge, Rose Raxton, Alyssa Allen, Elizabeth Keener, Iris Lindley, Julia Estes, Joy Montfort, and James Robinson. According to James Robinson, who is a U.S. Navy veteran, I saw Stacy Stites and Rodney Reed on many occasions. They would kiss and call each other baby. Why didn't you testify? Why were you not comfortable in testifying for Rodney? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Why? I don't want to get involved because I don't want nothing to happen to my family. You think uh, me? The police department could have actually would have actually done something and could have done well, something. Well, they think that money is good stuff. Okay, guys, I have Constance just joined us. So let me just pause this for a minute. I'm going to remove this. Constance, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming in. Hey, how are you? Hi, could you tell us, how do you know Jimmy for now? I am the woman that he kidnapped and raped. What year was this, Constance? The, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I know it's this okay. is hard for you, and I want to say thank you for coming up. 
Was this before or after Stacy's death? It was after. It was, after. It was so uh, October 2007. Okay, so you were the one that he put the gun to your head in the car. Yes, ma'am. Mm, well, it was outside of the car. It wasn't in it. It was outside. Outside the car. So, okay, from my understanding, you and your boyfriend were having a domestic argument, correct? Yes. Okay, you called the police. And so just walk us through from there, please. Uh, we didn't call the cops. Actually, okay. somebody in the apartment complex did for a noise disturbance. And um, we were outside arguing. And next thing we knew, there was a bunch of police officers that showed up. They had their spotlights on us. I actually tried to make a joke of it and tell my boyfriend at the time, you know, you run this way, I'll run that way. And he said, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And uh, so I stopped. And they got out and they came up, you know, normal police protocol. They separated us to see what was going on, what the issue was. Well, uh, Fennell, he kept coming to me and talking to me. And then he'd go over to him and talk to him. And uh, next thing I knew, they were putting him in a police car. Well... I asked him, you know, what's going on, Fennell? I said, what's going on? He said, nothing. It's normal protocol. We're taking him to a hotel room. We have to separate you for the night. So I told him, you know, well, why? He's like, well, that's just how it is. We can't leave you all together. So all the other police officers, they disappeared with him. And it left me alone with Fennell. Well, of course, I freaked out and was like, Look, I want him. Take me to where he's at, et cetera, et cetera. And at first, Fennell was, you know, doing the whole, well, we can't do that, blah, 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 blah. Sorry. It's okay. Take your time. I'm not going to interrupt you. I just want, because we've heard so much about it and the fact that you were willing to come up and tell us in your own words, I appreciate that. Well, I asked him where they took him. And they told me, uh, he told, Fennell told me a hotel. And I kept throwing a fit, saying I wanted him. And finally, Fennell said, okay, okay, I'll take you to him. So it was raining. And he opened the, the passenger seat of his patrol car and put me in it and turned the heater on because he said he didn't want me to get cold. And so we left. I didn't think anything was wrong because I was not familiar with Georgetown. So as he kept taking all these turns, I had no idea that we weren't going towards the hotel rooms. Okay. Okay. So what happened? I, I, okay. I don't want you to discuss the R part of it. What happened once everything was over with and you filed your police report? Are you called to, uh, are you called to report it? Um, after I called the police, well, 911 for a rape kit. I was standing outside on the phone with 911 and waiting for an ambulance. And all of a sudden, cop cars started pulling back in. And I noticed that the front one was Fennell. And I started yelling at 911 saying, why did you send the cop that raped me? And 911 told me, we never dispatched police. And that's what blows my mind. I know that the whole world saw on 2020 my 911 call. That wasn't the whole 911 call. That was oh. parts that they chose to play. So he gathered his friends and they came back to the scene. 
basically yep. is what you're saying. Yep. They chased me by foot, actually. The the parts of the 911 call that y'all don't hear is me actually running. When I scream bloody murder in the 911 call, right before it hangs up on national television, that's not the whole thing. I screamed and then I started running. And they chased me several buildings to the point they cornered me. I actually ran up the stairs because I saw two men standing up on the second floor. And so I ran up there to ask them for help. But of course they weren't going to help me. These were police chasing me. Why would they help me? So they went inside and shut their apartment. And I had no choice but to go back down. And they were already down there. So did they take you to the police station? Yes, ma'am. They actually made me say I made it up in their police cams and then took me to the police station after Fennell was talking. Do you remember the other officers' names that were there? I don't. I wish I did, but I don't. So when you got to the police station, when did they start believing you? Uh, when the Texas Rangers showed up. So was that Wartlow? Do you remember if it was Wartlow that, sh that showed up? No, it was not him. It was... Okay, I can't hear you. Um, it was not him. I honestly don't remember the names of them. That was kind of a blur back then. Um, they, I just remember... Well, they put me in a jail cell with a uh, phone and I called 911 again. And I guess I got the attention of them. I, I don't know, but they showed up nine hours later. So what I don't get is that he admit now he did admit to the assault. Am I correct? Yes, he pled guilty. And the only course. reason why he pled guilty was because the initial charges that he was facing, he was uh, looking at two executive life sentences. So he took a plea deal? Yes. Without my acknowledgement. So the district you attorney's were... office gave him a plea agreement and didn't tell me about it until didn't after he about agreed. it. Yeah. Okay. Were you aware of the other complaints that were out there during his time in uh, Giddings and Georgetown? Do you, are you aware of the complaints that were issued against him? No, I had okay. no idea. I, I didn't even know about Rodney Reed at that time. I didn't okay. find out until months after it was all over the internet, the news, and I started looking into it myself. What are your feelings of, as far as him being responsible for Stacy Stites' murder? Well, I can tell you this. I was protected by Texas with a false name, the whole nine yes. yards. I know, I know. And because I and you no longer I live actually there. Did, <laughs> I did my own research for years. Okay. Because I told myself, before you get involved with this, you honestly need to look into it and decide, is Fennell innocent or is Rodney innocent? Who's guilty? And so I did. I did years, three or four years of research before I ever reached out to Sandra Reed or Bryce Benjet. And I came up with the conclusion that besides for what Fennell did to me, Rodney did not commit that murder. He didn't. Do you so know that he was, he was investigated for the disappearance of another lady and her body has never been found? 
I'm talking about Jimmy for now. Yes. Yeah, Rachel Cook. Yes. Yep. Yep. I know that. Oh and nobody my. told me that. I figured that out myself. Sorry. That's okay, Constance. I just, I want to, oh my God, I just want to say thank you for even agreeing to come on and talk to us because I have told your story, but not in your words. They get to hear it from you. And I know you said that your husband doesn't like you to discuss it or do interviews about it. And no, he's in bed. I, just, <laughs> I really, really appreciate you coming on. And I'm not going to keep it. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Katie, you have any questions? For no, I, mean, I just want to say thank you for coming on and sharing your story. And I, there's probably nothing I could ask you that you haven't already looked up yourself so just you know what i wanted to ask you so the state of texas gave you a new identity they move you did they offer you any type of counseling for everything that you went through um when it first happened i got part of the texas advocates program mm -hmm. for victims and i went through a counselor through the state which didn't work at all she actually made it worse, but oh. since then, no. I uh, Georgetown PD pretty much paid me to shut my mouth, wiped it under the rug, and that was the end of it. The, oh, my goodness. So the other officers that were chasing you when Fennell came back to the scene, do you know if anything happened to them? I know one of them ended up telling the chief of police that he knew what happened that night and he couldn't live with himself and he resigned. But okay. the other ones, I have no idea. Well, I know one of them was investigating and we're going to get into that one too. And supposedly he committed suicide, but from everything it points to, he was executed. And that's why the other cop Lamp, was scared to come forward because he didn't want to go against the local law enforcement. Well, so, apparently, you know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of investigation. And trust me, I've gotten a lot of help from the uh, from the Rodney Reed advocacy people. As a matter of fact, they're the ones that told me to reach out to you and see if you'd be willing to come on and have a conversation with me. Oh, I talk and, to them all the time. Yeah. Oh, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not going to keep you any longer. Um, we're going to be covering this, so you're more than welcome to stay in chat. I, I don't want it to be, I know you just relived the trauma that you went through. And again, prayers for you. And I hope right now, it's been years, but you would never get over anything like that. No, that's what I say all the time. Like, Fennell served 10 years. I served the life since. Like to this day, I'm terrified of law enforcement. I don't trust them. I'm, I look over my shoulder all the freaking time. For example, I had a police at my house the other day. They were banging on my door to serve papers. I hid in my bathtub. Oh my God. Well, they don't know who you are and where you are from. So you have a whole new identity. It don't I'm matter. Just, I know. Well, I don't know. I understand. I don't know what's that. What? I don't even have the words for you, sweetie. I really don't have the words for, for what you've been through. And the fact that he actually came back and showed up with his friends. And they... Mm. Oh, yeah, he was, he was trying to beat uh, the ambulance to me, which he did. I do want to. You know what? I gotta thank said. you. I gotta take a moment to thank you because of the fact that all these years of me coming out, nobody, we're live right now, has listened to the whole thing. The TV shows I've been on has picked and choose what they're gonna say, and they hear the same thing. 
he kidnapped me, he raped me, I was scared. That's all they ever hear. No, I wanted you to tell your You were story. literally the first person at an A&E, Dr. Phil, anybody, who's let me tell my story. We can only hear it from you. And that means and a I lot. Want, like thank me. you. Thank you. But I really wanted you to tell your story. And I wasn't going to interrupt you. And I want to say thank you again for coming up and visiting with us. Do you have anything else that you want to say? That Rodney is innocent. And even if I took myself out of what happened with Fennell, my opinion has nothing to do with what Fennell did to me. Nothing. That's why I spent years doing my own research. Because I know that somebody can do something to you and still be innocent of a crime. That's why I took those years and I investigated it myself without coming out. And besides for what he did to me, I know with out a doubt Rodney did not kill that girl I'm, he I, didn't I truly and for the people who myself. think that Fennell didn't kill her so be it but Rodney absolutely did not kill her regardless of who did he didn't do it thank you thank you I mean after looking at this and going into this case and Katie is a forensics expert. She teaches forensics. And oh, is she? she? Happens, yes, she is. I don't know if I'm an expert expert, well, hey, but I definitely travel. <laughs> Connie, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Really, like my heart goes out to you. I, I just, you're really, really, really brave. So thank you. Thank you, sweetie. You don't um, have to thank me. I did what was right. Well, you didn't have to come on. You right. really did not have to come on, but you chose to come on. And I didn't expect it. I just happened to look at my phone and I saw your message. I'm like, oh my God, I'm live now. And you came right on in. Thank you. And I'm here if you need to talk, if you want to know what's going That's on. That's why I was like, oh my God, what time is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Stay in the chat. Look at what we're doing. Uh, feel free to add your comments in, but I'm going to drop you down and I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Well, you need to tell those women out there to not be scared, no matter who it is, how powerful, powerful they are. You have a right and no means no. And you need to let them know, both y'all, because I'm just going to be a little short story in all of this that you don't let anybody do that to you, period. So you, you can win no matter how big the mountain is. Let me ask you, did you testify? Because I didn't see a deposition from you. Did you testify at the hearing for Rodney Reed at all? Okay. No. Okay. You they never even reached okay. out to me. Have they reached out to you now that, that no, probably not because you're. Yeah, that's okay. a sore to topic. No. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. That's I'm a very to sore topic now. for me because. It's okay. Sad. I'm going to drop you down so we can. Um, finish this out and I know you're going to hear some stuff because I was playing a video but I understand if it's a little bit too much for you but people got to meet you and got to hear about hear your experience from your mouth and not from me just going through paperwork and telling them what happened and I really appreciate that so, no it's fine okay it's fine thank you do do. I appreciate you bye Oh my God. God bless her. It's oh. bad enough when it happens, but then to have to like relive it because this is all over the media. Okay, guys, I'm going to add, um, let's just finish listening to this really quick. And then we're going to get back to what we came in. But I wanted you to hear 
what was said and what was done because everybody is saying that this man wasn't under investigation and all this other stuff and that is not the truth so let's go with this he was never fully investigated for stacy's death why for most of 1995 jimmy finnell worked in the bastrop county sheriff's department before he moved to Giddy. carol stites stacy's mom testified at trial that Jimmy has 900 friends that work with the Bastrop County Sheriff's Department to keep him informed about everything. <coughs> One of these close friends was Curtis Davis Jr. Davis was identified by Rodney Reed as the passenger who accompanied Jimmy Finnell on the day Finnell confronted Rodney about Stacy. On the night of Stacy's murder, before Stacy was reported missing, Curtis Davis left work one hour into his shift. According to his time card that night, the reason given for Davis's early departure was a broken tooth. That same night, the night of Stacy's murder, Jimmy Finnell was seen with three other police officers outside of 1611 Cedar Street, two blocks from Bastrop High School. On that particular night, I noticed that my dog had been barking. Okay, so he was seen two blocks away. Remember when they said it was logistically impossible? for him to be there because they only had one car. They checked the mileage on his car and everything else. We now see that's not true. Ooh, I'm sorry. Constance, Constance. <laughs> so what you do is uh, you hit the button that says leave studio and then go back into YouTube and that way you'll be in the chat. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so what do you think? Katie? Sorry about that. I was on a mute. So what did you think about that when they said it was impossible for him? So this, yeah, this is the first I'm actually hearing of this. So this, they're saying there was another vehicle involved. Yes. He was with three other officers. Okay, because I had bits and pieces that I had read. That's That was my understanding. But there's so much evidence out there and so much information collected. So does this tie in to the two police officers, the one who was found dead? Is it sure? Yes. I, okay. Yes. Okay, I got okay. my notes and everything. Okay. okay, you got your notes. Okay, yep. so here we go. And upon me getting up to, to see what he was working for, I noticed that it was a man standing outside by the mailbox. And I stood up and I noticed that one of them was Ed Samella, uh, Jimmy Fennell, uh, David Ford, and this Rocky Wall. And I'm like, what are they doing outside? You know, it was kind of strange for them to be outside, you know, late at night or whatever. Rocky Warlow, he was my son's coach. Rocky Warlow, he had on, I know for a fact, he had on the, the dress shirt and the jeans, and he had on a cowboy hat. The next day, News stories broke about Stacy's murder. They called the boyfriend in turn, the fiance rather, and he put out an all points bulletin on his truck and they did track that truck down about 5.30 in the morning here in Bastrop at Bastrop High School. Jimmy's abandoned truck, which Stacy's corpse was in, was found in the New York Bastrop High School parking lot, two blocks from 1611 Cedar Street. The next day it was like, bam, you know, I'm right here on the main stretch, you know, where all this took place, you know, and it was like, I couldn't believe it, you know. I was mostly in shock because I started putting things, okay, that's why they were outside. This witness knew that she could not go to the local police with this information. This witness's information remains uninvestigated to this day. From then to now, it's like a constant reminder. I can close my eyes and I can still see them standing out there. It just continues in my mind. And I have to live with this daily. Why was Jimmy Finnell talking with Rocky Wardlow, David Ford, and Ed Salmala on the night of Stacy's murder? In his court testimony, Finnell said he was in his Giddings apartment with Stacy all night that night. Is it possible that four or more policemen knew about Stacy's death even before she was reported missing? Is it also possible that this is why the entire Stacy Stites murder investigation was questionable, suspicious, and incomplete? From the very beginning. Under Ranger Rocky Wardlow's control and supervision, investigators were told not to search Jimmy and Stacy's apartment. 
Jimmy Finnell's truck, the same truck that was used to carry Stacy's dead body, was returned to Jimmy before important test results were completed. Stacy's belt, the suspected murder weapon, was never tested because it was polluted by attorneys and or witnesses. A long list of other evidence was either not submitted or not tested. Other items, including Stacy's address book and daily planner, were retained by Rocky Wardlow. The contents of Stacy's personal items were never revealed by Ranger Wardlow. Officer Ed Savala, the original lead investigator of Stacy's murder, ended up dead under suspicious circumstances three months after Stacy's death. Ranger Rocky Wardlow, Ed Savala's former roommate, immediately ruled it a suicide. Ed Savala's family members disagree with Rocky Wardlow's conclusion. Who do we hear this? Okay, so guys, so on that night, let's just bring us back. Let me just read you this statement that Stacy's mom gave, okay? She gave a statement and the statement goes, let me read it. Um, according to Mrs. Stites, her daughter returned home from work as usual at about 1.30 p.m. on April 22nd, 1996. She went upstairs to the apartment she and fiance Jimmy Fennell, a police officer, shared, changed out of her work clothes and came back down. She stayed with her mother until 8 p.m. When Mr. Fennell returned home from baseball practice, they both went upstairs. That was the last time Mrs. Stite saw her daughter alive. Mr. Fennell told police that Mrs. Stites, Ms. Stites left their apartment to drive to work in the pickup truck by herself around 3 a.m. on April 23rd. The unoccupied truck was seen parked in a backdrop parking lot by a patrol officer two and a half hours later. So that's that's the statement that is the statement thank you crazy cat mama for the super chat thank you so much sweetie i appreciate it so what do you think you heard all of this the can i ask you a question yes this is on my mind the mother you don't think heard anything upstairs because then in the statement she gave to police she said she yelled to get him she just yelled right up mm -hmm. through the ceiling yes i want to tread carefully in what i say but you don't hear anything i have searched and searched and maybe i just haven't come upon it but they give you very limited detail about stacy's life prior to meeting jimmy and there's there just to me appears to be more that we don't know i find it very suspicious that the mother you know amongst all these reports of tension between the two of them she never heard anything do you believe that nope i don't i think she's scared i like think she's people. scared too and i want to be respectful of the deceased but i just there's there are some things yep. that don't add up i think she is really really scared um so i just got a message to check let me check what alex indiana said they're off to bed <laughs> Hi, Heidi. Oh, Can you pray God. for my father's dying from COVID? Deanna, and, oh, God bless you guys you. have our prayers. I am so sorry. I am so sorry, Alex and Deanna. I really am. Oh, this is horrible. Thank you, Crazy Cat Mama, for bringing that to my attention. I'm sorry. I, when I'm looking at another video, I cannot see the chat because I have to be able to stop it. So you guys are seeing it and I'm looking at the full video on another screen. So, oh my God, this is, okay. So with that being said, Ed Salmonella, the guy that you would uh, hear, he was found, there was another off, he was actually investigating mm -hmm. on his own. He wasn't assigned. He was getting to, I mean, but why was he investigating if she saw the four of them standing outside together. Right. I think it didn't sit well with him. I Something think was he, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And if you remember the other officer said him and Jimmy were friends, lapped them a late, whatever his name was. Yeah. He said that Jimmy's stories kept changing, uh, you know, where he was. But then you have Wardlow that decided not to, that it was impossible logistically. 
and if I'm not incorrect, he had a key to Salmela's apartment because they were previously roommates and went in there and did the. Well, they search. were still roommates. They were, they were right? Roommates. That's what I thought. And then the video At the time just of now, his I was death. Like, okay, because that confused me. I have down in my notebook that they were. So he just went in there and kind of cleaned up the scene. There, there was mishandling of evidence throughout this entire case. The entire investigation. So. With the PowerPoint that you sent to me, we're going to break that down because um, I think I want to do the other part. But let's just look at what you sent to me. And then I have Michael Biden's statement, too. And let me just grab the po great PowerPoint, girl. Go ahead. on. <laughs> <laughs> let me just get that so we can share that screen so everybody can see exactly what you're talking about so they can. Um, and you broke it down really well. And this Thank is you. information that you pulled from the medical reports that I sent you. Yeah, and I was hoping Dr. Melanie was going to jump on. I was going back and forth with her. I felt bad that she was sick. We were going back and forth a little bit, but there are so many questions. Like the nerd in me is just. Yeah, she is not feeling well at all. Dr. Melanie had a procedure about a month and a half ago, and she is not handling that procedure well at all. So let me pull that other one up so I can share the screen so everyone can see exactly what we're talking about here. So let me get to my screen. Let me make sure everybody can see. We're going to do a full screen, okay? So let me just do the full screen. Is it better if I turn my camera off or does that matter? No, because uh, okay. you're going to, because I'm going to need you to read this out. Okay. So I'm going to make it bigger. Okay, do you see it? Yep. Okay, let me get to my other. Do, 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 do. I can't do it yet. I need to pull the other one first. Sorry, guys. I need to pull the other one down so I can see it. Before. I give you credit because I can't. Do, I can't do all the share. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the beginning. All right. So this is Rodney Reed, Stacey Stikes case forensic breakdown. There you go, ma'am. Start right. reading. Start so I just, I, I'm good if I have visuals sometimes because I tend to go off on tangents. So I was just picking, you know, information that I found. So the body was found. They said it was called in at 2.11 p.m. on the 23rd, right? And at 3.11. At 3.11. And it's my understanding, right? It says near a, a dirt road behind Bastrop High School. So do you happen to know the distance between the Bastrop High School parking lot and where her body was found? Well, we just saw it on the screen. So if Rodney Reed lived a mile and a half from the Bastrop High School, Lost Pines, I'm going to say maybe a mile? That's not what I was kind of guessing, like not yeah. super far. Okay. And I was just kind of making a timeline for myself. And I was like digging into the Emmy at the time, which was Bayardo. Yes. It said he began his, uh, began his post-mortem examination at 1.50 p.m. on the 24th. Now, I, I get it. Maybe I mean, I don't know about scheduling. Are you curious as to why that wasn't started earlier? I, I am, personally. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's standard protocol. I just think that in such a high-profile case, I would... I don't know, but maybe that maybe Especially that's for a police potential. officer's fiance, right? That's what I was thinking. But then I started to go down a rabbit hole and maybe I'm just being dramatic. I don't know. But it, it, then he, Bayardo, established the time of death to be 3 a.m. on the 23rd. So about 24 hours, before, you know, from the time that he examined her body. Okay. So is this your comments, give or take four hours? Because no, that was in the medical report. Okay, yep. so that was in a medical report, but when they first did it, they said she died between three and five. Now I'm seeing it says give or take four oh. hours. So that would put it back to around the 1230 mark. Yes, and that those are the little details that got left out of the subsequent reports. And that's why I threw in that table about rigor, not to go over it, but if you look, there's not a hard and fast rule on rigor mortis. Like there, there are parameters but there was the whole issue of at some point they wrapped her body in a wool blanket. Mm -hmm. Like you had mentioned yesterday that the rigor had started to break, but that her knees were still folded. Yes. Or still bent. So that's around like the 36, I mean, the range is huge, right? Eight to 36 hours for that to happen. But you mentioned that Bastrop at that time of the year is really 
hot and humid, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious why, like you made such a good point. The original report actually validates that it could have been from 12 a.m. on, but that's not what we were told. Nope. That was just curious to me. And I can't be the only person who kind of picked Everybody's up on that. Everybody's curious. And I'm going to, um, so you have, uh, so you have all the other reports from the other doctors and they're stating the same thing you're stating the same thing. I noticed cause they said she was still, no, it's hot, it's humid. So if you found her at three something in the afternoon, it's not cold. So it's not like she's going to be still, no, it's hot and it's muggy. It's sticky. Yep. That's springtime for us. And that's, you know, a lot of rain, everything goes on then. And then I'm, and again, like, I don't know what the police staff is like there, if it's a small town, but like, I would think that the bugs out at that time of the year would be insane. And it noted in the medical report and the autopsy report, she had bug bites all over her. They never did any, like, yeah, but they never did any like forensic entomology. None of that stuff was done at the time. Okay. And then your next slide. So I did want to put the DNA results in there because I have to be fair. You know what I mean? Like the DNA results were kind of striking, right? Okay. It ruled out that it, it, it was Reed's DNA, which we never disputed in the first yeah, place. Never disputed it was his DNA. He said that they were in a consensual relationship. Right. Yeah. But and, you know, his, D, his DNA came um, from the other woman that he had assaulted in 95. Right. Okay. Right. So, and that's what Dr. Melanie and I were talking about. And I know it's probably jumping ahead, but the, the DNA, the only place that they found, well, that's not true. They found DNA results in several places, but they found the spermatozoa in her vagina. Mm -hmm. And it didn't appear that there was any, right? I mean, like I poured through those results. And even though initially they reported that there were lesions on the anus and this and that, there, was, there were true. no signs. Like the medical report states that undoubtedly mm -hmm. which leads me to believe that the dna was deposited there consensually do you feel the same way i feel the same way because if it was an assault a sec there'll be a lot of bruising right right and i didn't see anything oh, about bruising. oh my gosh i'm so sorry my dog. that's okay i didn't see anything about bruising did you or did i miss it so there was a lot of they were fingerprint. I'm going to give them a treat if they don't stop this. I'm sorry, fingerprint okay. bruising on her body, but a lot of it was said to be post mortem or peri mortem, like right at the time of death. Death, yes. So, and I'm, but I'm also curious because I don't think a bruise, if you were killed within those 24 hours, you're not going to have massive bruising yet. So I, I'm just, I'm with you. I think that you would have more, uh, maybe not, but I would think that in, in a hardcore, case of R, right? Wouldn't you have bruising on like the inner thighs and such? Yep. Everything. But there was none of that. Did you see any of that? Cause I didn't see yeah. it. No. And I noted it on the very last slide, but I have to say that Constance brought up a point that has been like driving me crazy. And we'll talk about it after, but the burns on her body, there mm -hmm. weren't a lot of bruises, but there were all these crazy burns that nobody makes any mention of. Like why were there burns? but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll quickly go, the, the the belt, I would think that a braided belt, I understand like skin cells are mostly dead on the outside of your hands. Your hands are really thick, like thick skin, but still like, I'm just curious why they just wrote off that belt. Everything I read was that they're just not gonna bother because it was too contaminated. If that was the murder weapon, why was it so contaminated? Yeah, why was it contaminated? When you said you found a piece wrapped uh, right next to her body and the other piece. Yeah. But so you, when, you, when you're strangling somebody, I'm thinking you're gonna take the belt and wrap around your hand. Yes. It's gonna go on the outer skin so you can have a better grip. You wanna hear, I'm, I'm crazy, I know this, but I started to think this as we got closer to going live tonight because there was that piece of the belt on the ground and then the other yes. piece she was, found with. So if that's the case and that she had no ligature marks to my knowledge on the back of her neck. Not on the back, think, no. Do you think if she was in the passenger seat, he put it around her neck and it snapped against the headrest? That's that, what I was thinking. She was in that truck or somebody put it around her neck that's while what she I was, was in the passenger too. seat. Yep. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Because you can see the marks around the sides. Right. And right. there was one like you can see like the buckle kind of there, but you there was nothing behind her. Right. 
which is unusual because if you were being strangled, I would think somebody would be pulling it around your neck. So that got me. And that's what led to me kind of looking at the anatomy of the neck. And again, this is where Dr. Melanie would be much more the expert on like percentages. I've tried to look it up like how many times during a strangulation case do you see certain features? But if anyone's a fan of CSI, a lot of times you see petechia yep, in let me the just cornea. Do that. There you go. You, you see the broken blood vessels. Yes. And you see a broken hyoid bone, that bone up top right here. Yep. Um, you see the, uh, you know, damage to that laryngeal cartilage, like the Adam's apple. You don't see any of that. And in fact, she was actually strangled below the cricoid cartilage. So that so, was down here. That was, yeah, below the purple, actually. And then they made- Oh, right the, here. Yeah. And they say that where that, the muscle that I have in that other picture, they said it went from one bottom level of the muscle to the other. So like across here. And again, I don't know, but that seems like that would be low for a strangulation, does it not? Yeah, I think they were trying to hold her in place. I think it was more than one person in that trial. I do that too. Time. I do too. I think it had to be. I really do. I think it was more than one person. I don't think she ever left that house, that apartment by herself at all. No. That's my opinion. I don't think so either. And he was coming from Little League and this and that. Who knows? Like, who came over. I don't, yeah, I'm sorry again, but this is, this part, Dr. Melanie and I had talked about just the fact that the whole time I was reading the medical report and the fact that there was no overt sign of sexual trauma, but that his semen, Rodney Reed's semen was found inside her. Um, I kept thinking that it had to be consensual, but then was she not afraid to get pregnant? And sure enough, later on in the medical report, it says that the autopsy showed atrophic ovaries, which I tried to show a little picture, aren't growing because you're on contraception. Yep. See, you saw, you read all of these things. Good. This is what I live for. I get so, it's, it's distracting. <laughs> yep. So she was on contraceptive because so, so there was no use of condoms or anything else. And you found a good point. Her nails were cut. That's the weirdest part. Because if you were going, and if you were going to rape somebody, I shouldn't say the word, if you were going to perform the R word on somebody, and you deposited semen in their vaginal canal because you just didn't care because it was the heat of the moment, why cut their nails? Why cut their nails when you already left your DNA? I don't get that part at all. That's a major, major part. But you also made a good point. No one checked Jimmy's hands. No one did anything. They never examined him, even no. though he was supposedly the prime suspect at that time. Yep. But they yep. never even um Don't they went... do that to everybody? Yeah, like... and they go do a search because that's yeah. the last place she was known to be at. Yep. So that these are some very valid questions. Does the cop do that too? And I'm thinking like you did, they did it to protect themselves. And at that time, there was no security cameras at HEB. I do not believe okay. there was any security cameras because of the attack that happened on Alicia. And, you know, uh, she had to identify the guy and she said that it wasn't Rodney Reed. Yeah. So, And then... This is just the last bit and I'll zip it. But this is what got me. Why was there no mention of burns? It says, and it said post-mortem, like peri post-mortem, or I forget the wording, that they were suspecting it happened right around or after the time of death. But she had third degree burns. It said on the left side of her face and her mm -hmm. ear, six by three. That's humongous. And then under each um, breast, like between her breasts, and then bruises on our left front thigh, another burn on the right knee and upper leg. So what caused all these burns? I do have a video about the burns, but here's the thing. Do you think he was torturing her before she died? Or was this postmortem or pre? That's what I'm trying to figure out. But what could have burned her? I don't know. Maybe he poured lighter flu, but as I told you guys, so she had the C-section. So she did have her daughter. Uh, that she mm -hmm. gave up for an open adoption. So there is another video about the burns and I'm going to send that to you. I just got it yesterday. Okay. So you can listen to it and you can watch it yourself, but you did an excellent job on this. You really oh, did. Oh, because of what job. you sent me. You just sent me all the stuff and I just read it. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So I want to go back guys. And I want you to finish. Now, after you saw all of that, I want you to listen to the rest of this video so you can hear for yourself. So I, I was trying to find a good place to stop it. And I did, I found a good place to stop it. So let me pull this video so you guys can hear it. Um, so you can see. The investigation of my brother's death, I do not believe was handled correctly. I believe my brother got into something and found out way too much is my feeling on my brother's case. And he was actually sitting back trying to figure out how to go and resolve this and ended up not being in this world anymore. Yep, that's Eddie's, Eddie's brother. Big Ranger Ward, I happen to be a personal friend of mine. And he provides um, valuable resources to this agency as well as the Sheriff's Office. This is David Board. David Board was one of the three officers with Jimmy Fennell on the night of Stacy's murder. With the assistance of Rocky, who acts as a liaison between this agency and the Department of Public Safety, um, Major Hand, Major Smith, good relationship. Officer Board also had complete custody of critical DNA evidence used against Rodney Reed. At trial, Sergeant Board recited a list of items he seized from Carolyn Reaver, Rodney Reed's girlfriend. Reed's girlfriend, Carolyn, never pursued or wanted to pursue any charges against Reed. Even though this case was dropped quickly, David Board never returned any of Carolyn's materials back to Carolyn. David Board kept these Carolyn Rebus items all to himself up until Rodney Reed's arrest two years later. David Board waited almost one year after Stacy's murder before he submitted the Rebus Reed DNA for testing. Why did it take so long for an alleged match to be made between Stacy Stites and Rodney Reed? Why was Rodney Reed's DNA not tested immediately? Why did David Board sit on evidence for so long? Can we trust the DNA evidence that David Board controlled and used to link Rodney Reed to the murder of Stacy Stites? Is it possible there was some kind of cross-contamination or switching of DNA samples in the Stacy Stites murder investigation? Is it possible Rodney Reed's sperm fractions from Carolyn Rebus's belongings were mislabeled as a sample from Stacy Stites. My thought process was, I'm just going to shake these trees up as hard as I can and maybe something will fall out. This is Lisa Tanner, the Texas Attorney General's special prosecutor. Tanner is considered the best prosecutor in the state, and she was the lead prosecutor in Rodney Reed's trial. Lisa Tanner, with her partner, Special Investigator Missy Wolf, smoothly orchestrated the prosecution of Rodney Reed. Tanner sold the made-up story of Jimmy Fennell, Rocky Wardlow, and David Board to the all-white Bastrop jury. Yet, the railroading of Rodney Reed was not quite finished. During the punishment phase of Reed's trial in which they sought the death penalty, prosecutors called two women to the stand whom they claimed Rodney Reed randomly attacked and raped. Both women had filed sexual assault charges in Bastrop years before, and both cases remained unsolved. Curiously, both cases had been investigated by Officer David Board, and Officer Board maintained custody of the DNA evidence and rape kits in each case. Sergeant Board pointed out in trial that this evidence was kept in a locked refrigerator and that only he had the combination. Though lab reports were presented at trial that allegedly connected Reed to both incidents, those tests and reports have been lost and are currently missing from court records. Did Sergeant David Board, who attended the FBI Academy, tamper with evidence in these two old cases to implicate Rodney Reed for rapes he did not commit? One of these two cases involved a 39-year-old woman identified here as B.H. This woman claims she was attacked in Bastrop as she wandered, lost and drunk, on the railroad tracks. Two witnesses claim they saw B.H. on or near the railroad tracks with a man named Pat Barnett on the night of the incident. Bastrop resident David Lewis Taylor told us he saw B.H. and his close friend Pat Barnett together right by the railroad tracks in Bastrop on that night. That same night, another Bastrop resident, Iris Lindley, also saw her friend Pat Barnett and B.H. separated by a short distance from each other, walking back to town on the railroad tracks. According to B.H.'s own court testimony, she had heard that Pat Barnett was bragging in town that he had sex with her that night. 
was VH given a special deal by prosecutors for her testimony to continue cooperation in Rodney Reed's trial? Yeah. The records indicate VH has a long criminal history in Bastrop County. And, alarmingly, VH had a serious aggravated assault charge dropped by the judge and prosecutor yep. exactly two weeks after Rodney Reed received his death sentence. The other old case that was in David Ford's possession involved the September 6, 1989 rape of a 12-year-old girl in Bastrop. First, Reed was living hundreds of miles away from Bastrop at the time, and he has an alibi for the entire date of this incident. Secondly, after the rape, the 12-year-old victim identified her attacker as another man, convicted sex felon James Slaughter, who lived in the same apartment building as the victim. Slaughter was eventually charged with sexual assault of a child in 1990 and convicted of another sexual assault in 1994. Reed has never been given the opportunity to defend himself against these charges. Again, can the DNA evidence that was controlled by Officer David Ford in these two cases be trusted? And the DNA tests that prosecutors presented at trial are now missing. Their status remains unknown, yep. and they cannot be retested using modern standards. Strangely, near the end of Rodney Reed's trial, Megan Clement, one of the prosecution's important DNA experts, testified about various allegations that have been brought throughout the country about DNA sample switching. Concerning how her company LabCorp received and processed DNA samples, Clement went on to say, we can only go by what they, the Austin Crime Lab, had labeled those samples, and what they said those samples were from. Yep. This testimony from Megan Clement raises big questions concerning DNA chains of custody and the possibility of mislabeling samples. We have presented just a few of the many questions and holes in the death penalty case against Rodney Reed. Many other troubling issues exist, such as an erroneous and incomplete medical examiner's report, lack of a verifiable chain of custody with Stacy's body, incompetent and extensive corruption of key public figures, including the felony conviction of Richard Hernandez, who was the Bastrop County Sheriff during Reed's arrest and conviction. Yep, he was forced to resign. Mm, mm, mm. How much more evidence do the courts need to reopen Rodney Reed's case? Will he ever be set free? Or will he be executed soon? So far, it's been 17 years. 17 long years. I haven't been able to touch my son. Or to just give him a kiss. For 17 long years, no Christmas, no birthday. We all want my son to come home where he belongs. He is a innocent. As far as executions, I, I try my best to keep that out of my mind. I, I'm not looking in that direction. You know, I'm, I'm seeing my children. I'm, I want to be with my family. That's what I'm looking at. Well, Stacy Stites is real murderer be released in September 2018. When Jimmy Fennell is scheduled to be set free from prison in Venus, Texas, one of Fennell's victims prays he is never released. I'm actually still afraid of for my life to this day. That is kind of... I fight the parole board every single year to not let him out. I, I, I have nightmares at night. I constantly look over my shoulder. I'm 26 years old and I can't be at home at night alone because I'm afraid that he's standing outside my house. All I can picture is a gun to my head and the last thing he said to me. How many other violent crimes did Jimmy Fennell commit before he was caught? And how many more people will he hurt in the future? Will anyone cover up for Jimmy Fennell next time? Okay, guys, that is, woo, we see it, right? There sure as heck is not enough for him to be sitting in jail, in my opinion, or to be on death row, no less. Like, I'm sure if there are people who disagree, it's just if. It, now there, 
they stated that there was no investigation into Jimmy Fresnel. Well, that is not true. There has been several investigations into Jimmy Fresnel. And I saw Susan's question in the chat about did they test the burns for chemicals or residue? I read somewhere that they didn't test for residue, like they didn't follow due process whatsoever is my understanding. And like, even when you teach forensics, you don't put a, a t-shirt in with a sock, right? And they they just cross-contaminated everything. So I don't think they did any testing. They didn't like do that. anything. Constance, thank you for the super chat. I super appreciate sweet. it. You didn't have to do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so guys, this is, um, let me just, I just want to add this one. I just want you guys to hear this real quick before we get out of here, because they are definitely lying about him being under investigation. Um, hold on a second. Let me just get this. Uh, this is, hold on. Let me get this so you guys can see this. And that's where my boyfriend worked, Polanski unit, death row. August 3rd, 1996, a little over three months after the Stacey Stites murder, Ashcroft police investigator Ed Samella died due to a suspicious gunshot wound to the head. Ed Samella had been part of the Stacey Stites murder investigation, was one of the first people on the scene of the abandoned pickup truck where he collected the initial evidence. And afterwards, he accompanied Jimmy Fennell to the wrecker where the truck had been towed so they could examine it together. Two weeks prior to his death, Ed Samella resigned from the Bastrop Police Department and surrendered his guns. Officer Paul Alexander, in an unrecorded interview, told this reporter that he himself confiscated two handguns from Samella prior to his resignation. The local newspaper reported that before his resignation, Samella had been indicted for making terroristic threats to an ex-girlfriend cited as the cause for his forced resignation mm, the indictment mm, mm. and the incident that caused it has not been verified the investigation of my brother's death i do not believe was handled correctly the bastrop police department came in understand and went to the scene and decided that it was wrong in this report he claims that he was called to the scene by bastrop police officer david board david board had advised board low that he was on the scene Aaron's suicide at a local backdrop apartment complex. Mm -hmm. Scott mm -hmm. Samilla, Ed's brother, had an opportunity to speak with the neighbor who last saw Ed alive, heard the gunshot, and called police. As it is relayed here, this 2015 documentary released by AE Television. The neighbor was across from me. He said, your brother walked into his apartment. I went back into mine to get some more boxes. He said, I heard a shot. He said, I came out and he knocked on his door. I called him. Nobody answered. He said, I turned the doorknob and it locked. So he said, I went back in and I called dispatch. He said, I went, opened the door, and there were already three police officers standing in front of the door, and the door hadn't been kicked open. Uh. Directly contradicts Rocky Ward Road's report, which states the neighbor waited 15 minutes to call police and omits any information on how police obtained access to the apartment. It also makes no mention of the fact that neighbors checked the door and found it locked. Though Wardlow writes that Samella was personally known to him, he never reveals in his report or in his 
trial testimony that he had in fact lived with Sabella and at one point he had a key to the same apartment where the shooting took place. A glaring omission of fact and serious conflict of interest. Wardlow's report and testimony indicate he determined that the death was caused by suicide due to a letter he discovered written by Ed Sabella's ex-girlfriend found on the scene and a subsequent interview with that same girlfriend who reportedly told Wardlow that Sabella had been calling her repeatedly over the past few days. The letter referred to in this report has never been provided to the Sabella family, nor was it ever made available. Okay. What do you guys think? I'm serious. What do we think about that? It was never provided. They keep saying it was a hand, you know, it was handwritten. The only thing she said is that he called her like 18 times. Do you see the cover up? All of this was submitted to me by Free Writing Read Advocacy Pro. I mean, in the Innocence Project. Mm -hmm. It's just too much. It's not coincidence. There's just too much. Well, that's what it's looking like. That's what it's actually looking like. It's it's a bad cover up, and not one but two cops that worked on that her day. It was like, so I understand why the other cop. Don't you think too, from everything I've read, that area where Rodney Reed was supposed, you know, supposedly to be, yeah, I can't even talk, supposedly hung out all the time, where there were other reports of him accosting females. You don't think Jimmy Fennell and his buddies were aware of that? I, yes, I they were, because right. they had already stopped him. Right. He, so, Yes, they knew him. for this perfect scapegoat. And, and it's kind of convenient that not one but two cars were the one that you tried to assault the other woman at when she well the car was coming and you jumped in and drove off happened to be in the same spot where they found Jimmy Fennell's truck which is about a mile and a mile and a half from Rodney Reed's yep. house. That was put there on purpose. And it, this is where and I'm going to stop after this cuz I'm watching the the chat and not to be like i said never to speak ill of the dead in any way but i'm just with the i see the comments about the mother saying that she heard nothing i find that to be so perplexing too and if you look at all the t-shirts every picture it has like a religious t-shirt on like um sites has one on i just i having a kid early on in life i feel like her mother just wants to she was that. sleeping no seriously just think about it though unless she sleeps really hard he knows that the mom is downstairs. I don't think he's going to do anything to her there. Oh. You remember we said maybe she was in a seat and somebody was back there and they had the belt around her neck. Yeah. So maybe he said he was going to drive her or something. You know what I mean? Because that's all I could think of. Like, Because a guy or somebody that was 6'2 was driving the car eventually yeah. because the, the, oh. everything was in that position. Yeah, so... Forgot to bring that up. Thank you. The car seat, I mean, the truck, it was pushed all the way back. Yeah. Yes. So it was pushed completely back. That's a guy. Right. And I think the way that she was positioned and then the whole sock thing, right? Like she was clearly carried out of the truck and placed somewhere. <clears throat> so was she, and I hate to say this, but it almost looks like there was more than one person carrying her in that fashion where her knees were bent. Yep, it had to be, because he can't carry her like that and lay her down in the same position. One person is grabbing the feet and the other one's has- uh, um, Right, her foot never touched the ground. Yeah, that white sock supposedly was, was completely clean. It's just, it's just blowing my mind. But guys, I'm gonna put the links for all the other videos. Uh, you can go back and you can watch the one that I just started playing. Uh, you can see where the fact that Jimmy Fennell had been investigated in several other uh, instances, like when he put a gun to a young man's head, he threatened him. So when they said, was there, they lied when they said, was he ever investigated? There were several between Giddings and Georgetown complaints made against Jimmy Fennell. So, I mean, this is, and, you know, court resumed today. So I'm going to get a little update on that. And that's probably going to be a pre-record. Uh, we're still trying to figure out 
if Colleen and Heather's going to be able to come on on Thursday. Hopefully they can. Uh, Heather reached out to me night before last. So, um, and that's Stacy Stites um, cousin. And she does believe that Jimmy Fennell is guilty. Uh, her family basically exercised her out of because she wasn't saying what they wanted, what they wanted to hear. She doesn't believe that Rodney Reed is guilty. Now you mean to tell me all this testimony you're hearing and everything you're seeing and all the new affidavit affidavits that's come in, you're going to tell me that you still believe this man is innocent and had nothing to do with murdering your daughter or your sister or your seriously. Thank you, Snuggle Bunny. Too many discrepancies. Too many. Not one. Not, but when I heard about the DNA, how it was solely in his possession, but Bort was the one that had it, but somehow or another, Wartlow got it. And they can only go by at the crime lab what they received. And I have that sworn affidavit from the crime lab. Mm -hmm. They didn't label this is what was sent to them. You, they don't know where it came from. And you hear, and it's not just this case. If you, I, I got very invested in the case that was in the staircase documentary. I remember that. And remember the lab tech was literally talking to someone. This happens all the time. Spit into the tube Spit. and contaminated it. It happens all the time. So it's, it's that. not a stretch that, you know, this is intentional. This is, this is just crazy. This whole thing. I don't even know why you, we're going... I'm just happy they actually gave this man an indefinite stay of execution. Because from everything I'm seeing. <laughs> right. There's no, it, it's questionable whether there's enough to have him in prison, never mind on death row. That's mind boggling. Now I'm being, I'm second guessing the other assaults as well. After seeing that other video, after seeing that I'm actually questioning that because it's just weird. He said they wanted a sample. They sent him out in the hall. I mean, he didn't have any problem with anything, but now you attach that to a one that happened in 95 and then a 12 year old who actually identified somebody else. That makes you wonder, really wonder. I think he was framed and I'm going to go by the name framed and I'm going to add those video links into the description. So well, thank you for bringing me up tonight. This is this was like I told you. I go down the rabbit hole. I I, I stopped doing my other work, and I'm just looking at it. girl. I just, look. I love it. I love it. I love it. And it's just that you know we had to look at it. And then when I got that uh, those other videos, I'm like, wait a minute. How do I fit this in? Then I had the mother statement. I'm like, oh, I can put that in there, right there. You know, you're trying to make it run and flow. You so, do a really good job. I'm in awe. So. <laughs> You do, you do. <laughs> I try. I really do try. But uh, let me see. What did Robin say? Thank you for doing this because when I first heard about this last year, I knew Rodney was innocent. Oh, my God. Thank you, Robin. And it was just, I forgot who sent me this, but I had followed it once before and somebody brought it back to my attention. I was like, oh my God, yes, I definitely need to get into this. And then the Crystal Rogers case as well. I don't know if you remember her. Uh, she was in a small town. Crystal disappeared. They killed her dad. They killed the mother and the daughter. Then the cop was killed. This is a whole rabbit hole as well. I know that case really well, but they haven't found anything there. And I think there's corruption in that little town as well. But it's just a lot. But I really want to thank you so much for actually putting light on what I was seeing. And I really wish Melanie was feeling better. I and she's feel not better, even Melanie. I know she's asleep, but I'm going to call and check because if he had to take her to the hospital, then. I'm really worried. He being Dr. Sasha. But guys, I'm sorry I didn't do the roll call, but let's just run through so we can see everybody that was in the chat. Snuggle Bunny was in here, and I'm, it's not going to take me all the way back to the beginning. I'm sorry. Kathy, Red Sox. Uh, I just want to acknowledge I was trying to put everybody's comments up. Maria, hi. Uh, Dear Rivette, thank you. And I used to do the roll call, but I was just so excited with getting 
up and getting started. Um, Robin is here. I just want, oh, 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 my girl is here. South Carolina in the house. I just passed her name up. Where did she go? Oh, there we go. She's in the house. Uh, Snuggle Bunny, of course. Susan, as always. I saw Sweet but kind of sassy. Katie, that's you. We know you. Payne was in the house. Thank all of you guys. Let's see. There's Maria. Again, Debbie Chavez, thank you. Uh, Alex, Indiana. Guys, please, I need you to keep Kelly Hildreth in your prayers. Remember, Kelly is my sub. She's been with me a long time. Uh, she had to have emergency surgery. You know, we're still praying for Miss Yvette. We know Alex Indiana is going through some things with her dad. Sorry to hear that. Crazy cat mama, as usual, is in the house. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Constance, again, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And I really, really want to say I really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. And let me see. I don't want to forget anybody. Um, oh my God. I think I got Elizabeth. I don't remember where I put your name up there, Elizabeth, but thank you. My fingers hurt. Y'all were talking all in the chat. <laughs> Glenda, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. I saw Robin, um guys love okay thank you for being here as well calypso thank you for being here i appreciate it i'm trying to catch our uh, sweet but kind of sassy i know i saw you and i said your name you're my mod i know i saw you okay guys i'm going to get out of here oh wait a minute there we go thank you for coming patriot thank you so much um I'm trying to run through and make sure I caught everybody because I really appreciate each and every one of you for being here. Thank you guys for being here. Katie, don't go nowhere. I need you to stay backstage for a minute. Guys, I'm going to play the out. We're going to get out of here. Thank you again. I appreciate everybody. Have a safe and good evening. Oh, John Yates is going live later tonight. He's going to have uh, Larissa on with him. So go catch up with Larissa and see what's going on with her. I will see you guys probably tomorrow. As a matter of fact, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Good night.